What's good, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Sport Exposure Podcast. As you know, we're here to expose sports stories, sport journeys, and to hopefully inspire the next generation of student athletes. We are here to create a safe space for student athletes past, present, and future, which leads me to my guest here today, Miss Kiana <laughs> Brown. Hi. <laughs> she is currently an assistant women's basketball coach at UMC, UNC Wilmington. Yep. Um, also a women's basketball native from the area, and we'll get into that. Tell me about yourself. Um, well, one, I'm so proud of you. This is awesome. So like being Thank here, you. I've been watching the videos and keeping up. So kudos to you. This is an amazing pro platform for like our young athletes. And um, even myself, I feel like I'm learning from watching, you oh know, some of the episodes Thank too. You. So, um, but I'm Kiana Brown. I'm from Williamsburg, Virginia. So I'll make a joke. We're not really seven, five, seven. I, was about to, I couldn't even go that. <laughs> <laughs> Because people will clown us for that but my area code is 757 um but um yeah I grew up in Williamsburg Virginia um played you know Lafayette High School Williamsburg Christian Academy uh played for Boo um and I think that's why I'm here you know where I'm at right now um in my career and uh you know just have a, a, a real love for the game I uh, grew up playing um you know since I was six years old and uh, I have a big basketball family so, so you didn't have a choice I know I did not <laughs> I did not have a choice uh, my dad's one of 13 and so pretty much everybody plays sports uh you know my dad played at Norfolk State um he he'll, he'll really love that I just shout him out for that <laughs> Um, I had an uncle that played at Bucknell, uh, you know, a couple of my uncles played overseas and stuff. And so, yeah, I didn't really have a choice um, in my family. I'm, I think I'm like one of the only girls that played. I had an aunt that ran track at JMU. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, in my own right, uh, you know, just stuck with it. And it's take, basketball is taking me, you know, pretty much everywhere I, I'm, I am today. So true born athlete, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. So, so before like we that. get into your journey and your story here at Sport Exposure, we're all about celebrating our triumphs and learning from our defeats. When that comes to mind, what do you think about when it comes to your sport journey and your Um, you know, I love this question, by the way. Uh it makes you think about it. But uh for me, you know, I think it just has everything to do with where I am today. Um, you know, going through college is so different now than when we were in college, as you know. And so, um, you know, I went to I played at ODU. Um, you know, it was a great experience for me being able to play on the home front and have my my people there to support me and stuff. But um, you know, it wasn't as it wasn't a glitz and glamour, you know, perfect situation. And um, I ended up graduating from Virginia State. Um, you know, I think I just wanted to love the game again when I transferred. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's why I'm here today uh, as part of my story. You know, it helped me be a better coach and uh, just a better person overall. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's. To me, probably what I Yeah. So growing up around athletes, that's all you saw. Your dad, your brother, your older brother, your younger brother. Like, and that's just from what I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't met the rest of the family. So where was your true intro to basketball? Um, so I used to live in Georgia for a while. Um, like I said, my dad, he's one of 13 and everybody's pretty much spread out. A lot of people live here in Virginia, but I have a lot of aunts and uncles that live in Atlanta too. So, um, from what, maybe I was like maybe three to about 10, I, I lived in Georgia. Um, and I wanted to be a cheerleader <laughs> when I was growing up. So, you know, my dad signed me up for all these camps, cheer camps, you know, Falcons, whatever. And um, he did a lot of basketball camps. You know, we always were in the gym, always stayed in the gym. And um, one time I was supposed to go to this camp and I went to him and I was like, I don't want to go. You know, I want you to teach me how to play. And so ever since I was six years old, you know, my dad, he's always had keys to the gym somewhere. So, yeah. um, you know, everywhere we went, he's he's worked at, you know, different schools where they allow him to have the keys and we're able to get in there at any point. And so, you know, from then on, like, it's just always been in the gym, always working. Um, you know, we would, when I was in high school, we would play for like state championships. And then the next day we'd be right back of in the course. gym. So, 
doing a clinic or something like that. So, yeah, I've, I've really just always been around it. Um, and it's taught me a lot of like life lessons that you don't even really think about, mm-hmm. like when you're playing or when you're learning how to play. Um, it took me to get to my adult age to be like, oh, I kind of learned this Things from who <laughs> like, Oh, that know? makes sense now. It didn't yeah. make sense before. Yeah. So, you know, I've always really been around it. Um, you know, like you said, my older brother played, my little brother plays at JMU. And uh, I think he's probably reaped the benefits out of all of He's this. going <laughs> crazy. I look, I'm like, this is not the same little Zay that was in the gym with us. No. Uh, so, yeah, you, we just always really been around the gym. I mean, like, it would be like Thanksgiving. We'll have all my family here in town. And uh, at the time, my dad worked at, like, HRA. And we would, like, do Thanksgiving tournaments where I it's like we're we, playing we pickup, going to hoop. <laughs> Christmas. So we just really always been in the gym. Yeah. Do you ever feel like that you were living in your family's shadow? I mean, you were the um, first girl, girl though. So yeah, I mean, no, you. I don't really think that. I think, like, uh, I, like you said, I was, I'm one of the first girls who kind of, like, went to the next level with it. Like, you know, my aunt played. Uh, she was actually pretty good from what I heard, but uh, she just, you know, things happened. She didn't really go on to play um, after that. But, yeah, I, I really never felt like I was in the shadow. I feel like... I mean, I had a cousin that went to Mount St. Mary's, uh, you know, just different people. But in my I created my own lane, yeah. um, just being the only girl. And I felt a lot of support by everybody. Um, yeah. I don't and know. I have to ask, because growing up in an athletic family can usually go one or two ways for kids. Yeah. And especially having a basketball dad. Yeah. That can be a bumpy ride. Yes. You may have may have may have may may or may have not experienced it. But talk about some of the things that you experienced because some kids can't different like separate the two. Oh, oh yeah. And I see that often. And some kids lose the love of the game because we got this basketball dad and I got this basketball family and I just gotta do it this way. And it's a lot on the mental. Yeah. Uh, you know, growing up, uh, one thing I love about my dad is that he never really like vicariously lived, you know, through us and his kids. Um, you know, he he had his own lane of basketball and he's been doing it so long that he never really tried to like force what he wanted for us onto us. And I mean, it was good and bad because it's like, OK, you don't want to go to the gym. That's you. But I'm telling you, I am i can't pay for college. I'm not going to pay for college. Like you got to figure out the way that you're going to make a way for yourself and be better and do better than what, you know, I did or right. your mom did. Um, you know, it was tough. Uh, I played for my dad all my life, I will say. Um, you know, we would play for Boo, but we wouldn't, you know, have anything in June. So I played for my dad's AU teams. Um, my dad played, he coached me when I was in, in high school, even if he was in the assistant. And then when I was a senior, I went to Lafayette. Um, he was my head coach. And we, that's my best friend, but we, we you know, we'll, we'll butt yeah. heads because we, we both love the game. But um, something that we like developed early on when I was in high school is that we would always give it 24 hours. So we had like this little 24 hour like rule um whether it was good or bad you know sometimes he couldn't help himself when it was bad <laughs> he'd be like i don't know if i can wait but we put in like a 24 hour rule where we couldn't really talk about the game we just you know let it sit let you know your emotions calm down um and then we would break down a lot of film um you know to be able to correct the things that he saw but uh, me and my dad have a, a great relationship so it wasn't that hard playing for him i think you know, my brothers, my dad will always say this. He he really loves to coach girls because girls, they regurgitate the information a little bit more than guys That's do. That's a fact. Because guys have an ego. You know, everybody think they yeah. him. Mm-hmm. Um, So I feel like me and my dad, we, we were butt heads, but like we got along very well. Um, you know, my brothers, they're the same way, but they have a little bit more lip than I do. So um, it was easy. I will say like it wasn't like I, there was times where I wanted to quit because of him. I know that that is a, a lot of the case for some people. But I think it's just really in those situations, their parents want it more than them or like yeah. they're trying to like vicariously live through them. So I think it's dope that you said that your dad told you, like, I mean, you want to go to the gym. It's cool. But I'm letting you know I can't pay for college. Yeah. So at what age did you know that you had to take it serious? Of course you took it serious because you were an athlete and, you know, that was the that was what you grew up in. Mm-hmm. But it's a certain switch that goes off where it's just like, OK, I'm trying to do this for a degree. Yeah, I think probably when I was like a sophomore 
and I had played for Boo one year and you know, I was on his on the 16 U team with Coach Jay, and uh, you know, you be at the games, and it's all those coaches there, and it's like, okay, you know, I can take it far with this, you know, no matter what level, as long as I get my school paid for, um, you know, that that was all I really cared about is like whether I fit in that program, and um, you know, I, I saw it as very tangible. So then I was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna get on my grind. I was on it before, but um, I think I after my sophomore year of high school and mm-hmm. just going into AU. I'm like, OK, yeah, I'm, I'm really just get after it um, and showcase what I can do and just, you know, go all out and see where I, where this can end up. And what was your recruiting process like? Uh, it's so funny, like being on the phone with these recruits now, because, um, you know, it's changed a lot. A lot of the rules have changed, like when they can hit you up and stuff. But, um, you know, I had a lot. I, I, for a while ago, I had all these letters and stuff that I kept. But I just tossed it. I <laughs> tossed mine too, not too long. I'm because like, okay. It was taking up exactly. space. But I mean, a lot of mid-majors, um, you know, that was my level. Uh, Richmond was probably my first offer when I was in like the eighth grade. Um, and, you know, just like a lot of mid-major schools, JMU, ODU, uh, Richmond, um, just a plethora of the mid-majors. This is random. I just want to point this out. Can you speak roughly on taking advantage of, because I feel that because we played on an elite team, even if a coach was coming to see you play, I took advantage of that too. Oh yeah. And a lot of kids don't see the importance of that. Oh, they're here to see such a thing, but you never know. It's so many offers that I got just based off my teammates. Yeah. uh, I think it's tough for the kids these days because of the social media and that presence of like, Oh, you know, uh, I have all these offers. Like we didn't put, I did not post all them offers that, that was I a have. Lot. Like yeah. it's a lot. Um, I think it's hard for the kids these days to look at it as like, oh, I have an opportunity. Um, I think that they look at it as like, okay, th- this is their opportunity to like shine for this person. But, um, you know, me, myself going to the tournaments, you know, yeah, it might be other schools that are looking at this certain player, but I look up because I watched them you know, I watched this team and now some other girls on the team and it's, it's, it's vice versa for them. It's like you should go into it just wanting to do your best no matter who's there, because you don't know who you might you never know. spark an interest to or you don't know what these coaches need. You don't know, like, you know, their needs in the next word couple of mouth, years. Right. Yeah. Word of mouth. And so, yeah, I think it's tough for the kids these days just because of the social media presence. And you have the ability to, like, compare what you have going on to what other people have going on. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like you said, you took advantage of when people were at, you know, your games, maybe right. looking at your teammates and, you know, you just if you work, it doesn't matter yes, what you saying. do. <laughs> you just never know. Yeah. So moving on to college, how was your college experience? I know you touched roughly on losing the love of the game. Mm-hmm. And that's something that a lot of us can relate to. Yeah. Um, me personally, I didn't care enough to transfer. It just was what it was. But that's not everybody's story. So talk about the things that you went through, the things that you saw, the reality of college sports. Yeah, you know, I I chose ODU because it was close to home. Um, So many people that I knew, like from my area, if they were just even a regular student, like went there, um, had a rich women's basketball history. And so, uh, you know, going into it, I know just like you knew, like college is not going to be like high school. You know, you're taking the best player from every team and putting it on one team. Um, And so I think the hardest part was just like how like some of the things went like teammates wise or like just like the drama outside of the game that really impacts your experience at college. (laughs) Putting 15 girls with 15 different hormones in one space. Look. Is a lot. I grew up with two boys in my house. Okay. So that was hard. You know, you, you spend the whole year with this, Literally, this go team, to sleep, wake you know, up to them. like you, you, you're there in the summer, you're there in the fall, you're Christmas, there Thanksgiving. for Christmas, spring Thanksgiving, break. spring break. Like you never really get a break. And so I think that, um, that plays a key part in it is that we're around each other so much and there's so many like different personalities I'm sorry um personalities and just like things I think 
you know, I won't, I won't say that my experience was like tarnished, but there were so many like just off the court things that just impacted like on the court. And um, it wasn't just players. It was coaching staff, too. Um, and so I think I just kind of lost my love for it along the way. I really love basketball. That's what I come from. And so, um, you know, I think when I went in there when I was a junior, I had one year left. And the, there was no portal, y'all. So <laughs> yeah, we didn't have that. Uh, you know, we didn't have that. We didn't have a whole. You know, it's it's totally different. You know, kids now can just go on the portal. They don't even have to tell you. They can just put their name out there to see if somebody else will hit them up. And then if not, they can come back to your school. And you know, I had to go look my coach in the face and say, "Hey, I want to you know be released from here." Um, and that was tough, but. I was taking back my love for the game um, and it was it, I didn't care what level I, I went to Virginia State Division two. We were very good. One of the you know top teams in the country uh, set a record while I was there. First team 15 and 0. like, you know, so it, it was fun again. Yeah. And so that's all I really cared about. I still went to school for free. So people have Most that misconception that, you know, if you don't go Division one, you can't go for free. You can. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, I think just a lot of the stuff off the court impacted me on the court. And I'm I've never really been like that. So, uh, you know, I just kind of wanted to get away from that and start fresh. It says, you know, I'm nosy. I want to know what happened <laughs> off the court. <laughs> Let's get into it. I want to know. I mean, um, because those are those are career changing moments. And yeah. I mean, you can speak on what you feel like going in depth about. But it's a lot of kids that go through those moments and mm -hmm. don't know how to get through them or they yeah. don't have the power to take that power back. You know, I was a kid that I let my coach suck the love out of me and I didn't care to take it back. Mm. And I tell kids all the time, don't ever let anybody take that from you. Yeah, you're right. Anybody. I don't yep. care if it's a coach, your mom, your dad. That's something that you we should demand power over because, you know, we are the ones that got us to the point, right? We got us to where we are, which is not easy. Right. Playing collegiate ball at any level nope. is not easy. Nope. It's a job. Yeah. And there's so many things, there's so many distractions when you get to college. You have distractions. You have the women that you're playing next to. Like you said, you have coaches, coaching changes, at home stuff that, that would trickle down no matter how close or far you are. And those are things that not everybody can bounce back from, which right. is why I asked what type of situations were, were you going through off the court? Just a lot of drama. Like, I don't know. I can't really like pinpoint yeah. just one thing. Like there was just so many things that just took place off the court that affected me mentally. Uh, and I really applaud these this group of student athletes because they're really like keyed into their mental health. And I think like when we were in school, you know, we were just you had to just do it and do what you That's were told. We were up. And yeah, like. It, they have the power these days, um, which I feel like they understand that they have the power, which is great. Um, you know, they, they stick up for their mental health and you see more spaces created for them to ha fix their mental before it gets to a point of right. where they don't love it or they don't want to be around the game anymore. Um, you know, for me, it was just like drama that I wasn't used to. And so like. It made you uncomfortable. It just made me uncomfortable. Right. Uh, it made me just be like, you know, this is overpowering how good my team was. Um, you know, my sophomore year, we were 500 team. We went to the Conference USA Championship. Like, we should have won way more games. Um, you know, I played with a WMEA prospect, Jenny Sims, um, you know, who's still playing today. Uh, you know, very great talent. And so I just felt like our teams could have been a lot better, but we just our culture wasn't like established to where we had that like team, you know, that we you don't have to get along with each other on and off, but it just was never separated. You know, good teams, you're not going to be best friends. You're not going to always be friends with your teammates, but on the court it's a business. And so when we step on the court, things that affect us outside, it can't come in, you know, and so I just felt like. It was just too much of that and I was over it and like I just wanted something different. Understood. How how did you choose Virginia State? So, um I wasn't going to be able to graduate 
you know, I had too many credits. I would have had it in some of the classes. Where, at Old Dominion? Yeah, at ODU. I wouldn't have been able to like graduate early. So a lot of the schools, like Division One schools that were hitting me up, it would have been that case of like paying for two years of school, but one year of play. Whereas like now they can just transfer exactly. and play immediately. And um, that's a good point because a lot of kids need to examine that before they transfer. Yeah. Because every school is different. Private school, public school. I know at Hampton, everything does not transfer. Right. And I know we'd be so antsy just to get to the next situation, but sometimes it could put you back. Yep. It could, you could be paying out of pocket a semester or two. Yeah. Please examine all possible outcomes before you guys jump out there, okay? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think... So for me, how I got to Virginia State, um, you know, all these Division One schools are hitting me. They're like, are you going to be able to graduate so that they could pay for one year and whatever? And I'm like, some of the classes I need are not, you know, I'm not going to be able to do it. And so, you know, I'm sitting there with my dad. I'm like, I don't care. I'll go play Division Two. Um, you know, some of the best Division Two programs hit me up. Cal UPenn, that's a very good D2 program, um, you know, just a plethora of division two schools, but I always told my dad I wanted to go to HBCU if I ever transferred um, just to get that experience and be around my people. And um, so Virginia State just happened. It kind of like happened perfectly. Um, I, I went there. I visited. I loved it. Uh, they have great facilities at VSU. It's a very good school. Um, you know, I, I went to Union. I saw Union. Um, you know, Union has a, had a great women's basketball program uh, h- history wise. And, um, you know, it was, it was close to home. I'm like, my parents can still come and support. Uh, you know, it was there. Like the love was there. The family aspect was there. And so it was an easy choice to be able to just continue to play and we had a good team so that helped out a lot too yeah and a lot of kids can get um we can be like sometimes I tell you to go away from home yeah and I have a love hate relationship with that and I'm sure you can relate to it because I understand why they say you to leave but there are a lot of pros with staying close right because when you think about college athletics and only another athlete will understand being a collegiate athlete, you're isolated. Mm-hmm. Like you're like you're in society, but you're you're in your uh, your own you know s- private sector, right? Mm-hmm. And if I go to a school that's eight hours away, being a collegiate athlete, dealing with the things that we deal with, and my mom can't even come see me play unless she t- subscribes to a subscription at seven ninety nine a month, right? That can also play a part in your mental. Mm-hmm. So talk about what being home or close to home did for you because I know it did a lot for me because I I can't imagine if I went to any of the school honestly truly um me being home helped me because because I hated basketball at the time just like I still have love around me right or I still have people that know me I'm still you're still up the street like you know I'm still in my basketball community yeah which helped me a whole lot because Looking back over it, the things that I went through, I wouldn't have had that same support had I not been at home. Yeah, uh, it's so funny you asked that. So in my recruitment process, like my mom, she was like stickler to trying to get me to stay home. And even Xavier, um, you know, she would just always plant things in my head like, well, what if something happens to you? Like, we can't be able to get to yeah. you. Like, I don't want to have to take a plane. And, you know, when you're younger, you'd be like, mom, I'm going far. Right. Like, you're not going <laughs> to see me. Like, you better get ready for it. But I, I was really gra- glad that I stayed home, um, you know, just to be able to like be around family and friends and like familiar faces uh you know it was definitely a positive experience for me just being able to go away like just like what you're saying like when you're an athlete you're isolated so being able to go home and wash my clothes or get a a home cooked meal meal or you know something just being able to drive through that tunnel or even from Petersburg uh my teammates at Virginia State hated me because I would always go home but it's like it was just like comforting, oh, right. you know, like it's it's comforting to know that you can get in the car and go 45 minutes and be home or your parents can, you know, be one hour away and be able to come to your home games and other games in the area that, you know, they're not spending so much money on flights or whatever. Through, right? They can drive, you know, to our, our tournament or turn 
to other Virginia schools or just schools that are close by. Um, and so I knew I was a home kid. Like I've always been around family. Like I have a huge family. So family is really important to me. And so, um, you know, in the beginning of my process, there was other, there were schools that were pretty far and I'm like, okay, I think I could rock with, you know, mm-hmm. little Florida schools or whatever. But, um, you know, I was, I was very glad that I stayed close, especially because as I got into my professional career, I wasn't close to home anymore. And so I at least have that experience of like, okay, I've been at home. Like, I know what it's like. I know I have that support there. And so now, you know, when I go to be a graduate assistant in Valdosta State, you know, that's nine hours from home. So we're going to get to that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, like. Yeah, I would I would come home, but it'd be like, okay, Christmas or, you know, whatever. You can't just get in the car. And that affected me a little bit when I was a GA because it's almost like being a student athlete still. And, um, you know, I would I would say that to myself. I'm so glad I stayed close. And then I just waited till I was older and more mature to, like, be away from home. I'm glad you brought that up because I also went almost nine hours away. Um, Yep. And during that process, all I could think about, I am so glad I didn't do this during college as mm-hmm. an 18 year old. Yep. Because I did it. I was 25. I think I was 25. Yeah. So like, I had experienced being home. I experienced the localness, whatever, which is why I wanted to give myself a different perspective. And mm-hmm. working in sports, you kids, you're going to have to leave Virginia. It's just one of those things. I, <laughs> I, things are changing. Listen Not to as her. fast as we want to, but it's only but so much you can achieve. One, having desires to work in the sport industry here. And I felt like I did everything I could do here. Yeah. And going nine hours was rough for me. Yeah. So let's talk about your, your experience um, in the dirty South. Yeah. Uh, wait, I went to Valdosta State um, in the midst of COVID. So uh, just to kind of like backtrack and tell my sports story, um, I was a communications intern at the MEAC after I graduated, um, which was a great experience. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, then I took a job at University of Maryland as a uh, media relations assistant, getting paid hourly, living in Maryland. So um, I those stories. <laughs> shout out to my uh, cousin, Kristen. I stayed with her because it's very expensive to live in Maryland. So um, that's I'm, another thing I'm to know. Real quick. Did you always have dreams to work in sports? Did you? Uh, no. I How did you come so. to that? I think when I graduated college, you know, it was just like a sense of, I don't know what else I'm going to do. Um, I did go through like a little, like, I, I feel like depression that a lot of athletes go through after they're done with their sport because it's so much of your life and so much like routine. Um, my parents were very supportive though. Like when I graduated, they're like, you don't have to get a job, just hang out, you know, whatever. And it was just not for me to not have a job. And so, um, I was working at a resort and I was like, I got to find a way just to do something like around sports. And, um, that's how I came into that internship at the MEAC. And it was great, like to be around all the sports, um, you know, being that a, was meter- a game changer for me. Yeah. Working oh. at the MEAC. At oh yeah. That level. Because you get exposed to everything. I know you were media relations, but I was never media relations, but I still got exposed to media oh, relations. Oh, yeah. Oh, so me, I was marketing. Is yeah. great. It was great for me. It was great for me to learn from some of the top people in this industry who have been in it for 20 years, 20 plus years. Um, it really empowered me to to be like, oh, yeah, like I can do this. Like everybody, you got to start from somewhere um, and not putting so much pressure to like be the best at your job. I feel like it helped me, like, like you said, get my hands in a lot of different things that like sparked my interest to, you know, at the time it was media relations or communications, but I think I was just trying to do say, something. Media, they didn't care. And no, I, they didn't I, care. I was thankful for my experience there because of the open door policy. Mm-hmm. Yep. A lot of internships, a lot of inter- don't go the way that they did it. Oh, yet. no. Um, my boyfriend, <laughs> he was a, an intern at the SOCON. And when I tell him just like how I was getting paid and the f- career forum and like living things, all right. Yeah. <laughs> the things I like, you know, they provided for us. They they do it the right way because they know, OK, you know, the perception of HBCU, we're going to at least give the top tier experience. We're going to give our younger kids, you know, the exposure, like paying for their careers from the um, women in sports symposium yeah. that they do and just different things. They did a very good job of like exposing us to uh, op- opportunities outside of it 
and just showing us that it doesn't matter where you come from. Like you can take this and, and run with it and make it your own right or your right. own lane. So shout um, out to Dr. Thomas. He for was real. huge on professional development. For real. <laughs> he, he definitely was. And so that kind of landed me to Maryland, um, which is it was an amazing experience working, you know, at University of Maryland. It is a top notch um, school and just how they run things program wise. Um, I was able to do statting. Uh, you know, I was softball media contact. I was secondary with women's basketball. And that really kind of like sparked where I am today. Um, you know, just being in that atmosphere, the game atmosphere, you know, help with football and whatever. I'm like, I'm gonna be honest with y'all. I don't care about none of these sports. <laughs> like, but my I sport. do. <laughs> like, I do basketball. Um, and so, you know, I went through the whole year. Then COVID happened in the middle of softball season. Um, and I just went to my dad and I was like, I want to coach. Um, and I, you know, I'm like, you know, I don't really necessarily feel like I have to go back to high school. Um, you know, I, I talked to Kenia Cole and, um, you know, just other people in the business who are like young and, you know, how to get in. And so, um, that's how I landed, uh, Valdosta State as being a graduate assistant. Um, you know, any of the future coaches out there being a GA is like one of the best ways to go to be a coach because, or it, just anything in sports, yeah. I wouldn't even put. Get it, your just foot on in coaching the door. yeah because you'll you'll get your foot in the door and you just do so much um you know about way just, out but it's worth it it, <laughs> it is a time consuming <laughs> thing so don't think you're just gonna be in here doing whatever but um Valdosta state was great in that aspect um title town usa is what Valdosta is called um you know they had a great pr top football program in the country division two um while i was there i was we were ranked as high as five in the country division two uh, women's basketball wise uh like we were a good team i learned a lot i put my hands in a lot um and then also like just off the court uh i called the first ever uh live stream for volleyball um i went to the coach and i was like i played volleyball in college i mean in high, in high school i really love volleyball you know whatever they never had anybody do the live stream and call it and so i did um and you know Great things like that for yourself. Yeah. yeah yeah i helped with softball they had one of the best uh softball teams in the country at valdosta state so it was just like a little powerhouse that i never knew anything about and until i wanted to be a coach um you know i did so many interviews like to be a ga at different places nai schools division one division two and uh, that just really worked out for me and it was a great opportunity um but like we were talking about uh just being away from home uh i kind of lucked up because i have a lot of family in atlanta so it was like a three-hour drive so i would really be in atlanta yeah, all the time me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so i mean that really helped me out uh, a lot just you know having something to do um you know south georgia was pretty boring um it was nothing really there but um i think that at all being like like you said like 24 um you know trying to figure out my lane and what i'm doing in college athletics I, that really helped me a lot um i was homesick <laughs> uh but i think i i think being able to go to my family and hang out and still like you know um uh, go to georgia atlanta for thanksgiving and just a weekend yeah just a weekend yeah. like it helped me out a lot and in hindsight everything that happened prior to Valdosta state was preparation for Valdosta state mm -hmm. and a lot of kids don't see that when it comes to working in this industry working in the sports industry there's so many different routes you can go in sports and my best advice to kids now is just get your hands in as much as possible yep nine times out of ten you're not going to be paid but still get your hands in as much as possible because it's easier for you to weed out what you don't like, what you do like, and really create your own opportunities like you did at Valdosta State. Yeah. Like you had the, the education. You had the experience from Maryland. Mm -hmm. You had the experience at the MEAC as well. So it's just like, why can't I do this? Like, I know I can. And those are, as a woman, I'm going to say as a woman, but even just to make yourself stand out. Mm -hmm. You have to go above and beyond in the industry, like because it's a very, very competitive industry. Everybody wants to work in sports. Yeah. And it's one of those industries that you don't necessarily have to have a degree to work in mm -mm. and setting yourself apart like you did in those opportunities. Like, how did you see that opportunity? And how did you approach that? Because a lot of kids, they can see the value in it and may not know how to really take that step. 
I don't know. I just have always been like a, I'm a do whatever I have to do right. type of person. And I think like working at the MEAC and working at Maryland helped me uh, learn that it doesn't matter what it is. Like you just do it right. uh, because you just make yourself a stronger candidate for any job that you go for in sports. Like, yeah, you know, maybe I will coach for the next 10 years and then I want to be like an administrator. Well, I've done, you know, certain things to be able to say like, okay, yeah, uh, I worked with compliance as a, you know, a basketball coach directly being recruiting coordinator or, you know, I've done communications things or, you know, just put my hands in different things. That, so versatile. Yeah. That's, that's really the name of the game working in, in college athletics and in sports period is that you kind of have to be willing to do whatever. Like if there's something that your department needs, if there's something that my department needs help with, I'm going to volunteer because like, you know, you never know these people, you might, they might work somewhere in five years exactly. and, and remember the time that you like stepped out on a limb and, went to help them out and do something um, because sports is so relationship based too. Um, you know, you, you foster those relationships by doing the things that you don't necessarily get paid for right. or, you know, that you might even think, I don't want to do this. Um, that's how you get the relationship. And so I think I understood that going in that, you know, I'm just going to make this opportunity the best that it can be for me. Um, by not like pigeonholing myself into only being the women's basketball GA or uh, only being the Dobo or the assistant coach. You know, you just try to help in any way that you can. Right. You never know who you're going to come across in this exactly. business. Exactly. Exactly. And one, I want to highlight on what is, it is to be a woman in this industry. Mm. And you and I have seen it from, from very <laughs> multiple levels. And it's something that doesn't go anywhere. And I try to shed light on any woman that desires to be in this industry because it is hard. Yeah. It's hard, no matter what your color is, to be a woman in the room. Yep. And it's that much, it's that more important for you to step out there to show them. Because as women, they automatically think that we don't just, know anything <laughs> about sports. We're and just we're here. Just trying to look cute, yeah. put our outfits on. No, um, you know, I feel like early in my career, there were some powerful women that I learned from. Um, you know, Sonia Stills, uh, you know, just Tiffany Tucker right now that's at UNCW. Um, and there's so many other women, uh, you know, just the women in sports symposium, you know, we're talking to women, athletic directors, uh, yeah. president, women, presidents, uh, SWAs. SWAs. Yeah. Like there's so many women that you look at and you go like, wow, like it's so empowering to see that, like, you know, your value to your institution or your um, team or whoever you work for. And so I think like, especially being a black woman, um, you know, working at Maryland, it was great, but I was the only black person in my uh, department that I worked with and the only black woman. Um, there was one other woman, her name was Rose. She's great. Um, but it's like, we we sometimes we had to fight for just you know our thoughts or our ideas to be heard or you know just and that's just in general like I feel like a lot of women we don't want our light to shine because we don't want to make it seem like we're trying to do too much or be too much but um what I've learned over the years is that like no you you have to you like have to give your givings because, um, you know, there are so many just fearless women leaders, um, who are, they're creating that paveway or the pathway for, uh, you know, young women to, it's, it's way different now yeah. than what it has been in the past. And so, um, I think that, you know, it's just growing women in this, in this profession, it's just continuously growing, um, you know, to see women that work in the NFL NBA. Um, you know, college athletics, you see more and more um, NBA teams hiring women as coaches, player development. Um, I think that it's just growing in a direction of like, yeah, maybe one day I'll be a freaking head coach of a, I don't know, NCAA team, yeah. a, a men's team, you know, be a associate head coach of an NBA team. Like I'm not putting any limits on myself. It's so important to that. see that representation. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought up um those professional development opportunities are what exposed me to the opportunities that I walked into. Yeah. If that makes sense. Like I would have never known that it is okay for me to be a black woman in spaces at the level that I was in. 
Yeah. Because if I did not see another like a Sonya Stills or Tiffany Tucker or Jennifer Lynn Williams, like those mm-hmm. are the women that I looked up to and I saw what they were doing and they're just unapologetically them. Yeah. And they straight the society tries to teach us to be anything but us to be in the room. Yeah. Um, specifically black women, of course. But I'm speaking to all women because I know all women go through it. But it's so important just to walk in who you are. Because you never know who's behind you. And I can say myself, I stayed in a lot of very uncomfortable situations working in sports, not for me, but for the women behind me to mm-hmm. break the barrier, to break the the stigma, to let them know that it's okay to just be yourself. You mm-hmm. can come in this room and have big hair. You can come in this room and have long hair. You can come in this room and have braids to the back of you. Like, you know, of course, everybody's professional development um, realm is different. But those are the things that I did just to push the stigma on purpose. Right. And I'm so glad that I did that because even it gave me more confidence because I'm seeing the little girls be attracted to me off the strength of me being myself. Mm -hmm. And as you being a woman's basketball coach now, fast forward to now, I'm sure all of that plays a part because you have young women looking up to you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, you know, if I don't show up and be who I am authentically, I can't really teach somebody to be their authentic self. Um, I think that that's like one of my main duties as a coach is to like walk away, um, you know, our student athletes to walk away and just feel like they got better as a person um, and better in all the aspects that you're saying, like more confident, um, you know, can walk in the room and and not feel intimidated no matter what room it is. Um, And I think that like this is so small, but if you just look at how the I'm using women's basketball as an example, like think about all of how they dress now playing. Right. Like this is such a big topic that it might seem small to other people. It's huge. But it's to huge. Us. It's it's huge to me because they play with their nails, they play with their lashes, their long baby heads, yeah, their baby hairs, their their long braids, their whatever. And I love it because I feel like you know, they are who they are. You wanna wear makeup plan? I mean, it might get all over your jersey, but um Be I you. think that is just another way for them to express themselves. And I think in so many ways um, that is like dimmed down when you get to college, uh, you don't really get the chance to always express yourself that the way that you want to, where you always have to wear this clothes and match your teammate and wear these shoes and you can't go here, you can't do this. And so I think that, you know, something small like that, that's a way of empowering them to just be themselves. Right. And so I think, you know, for me as a coach, that's like my, my main goal, my main purpose. It's not really the wins and losses is just to make sure you know our young women walk away feeling like I can do anything I can be who I want to be as long as I put my mind to it doesn't matter any all any of the other things that come uh, come into play so right and your sport journey alone you've been many many places (laughs) (laughs) many many places in a short amount of time and from playing to working in sports and now coaching women's basketball and the life lessons that come with it from transferring tell me all of that how all of that impacts your career now because you are able to look and have conversations with these girls from very various different lenses yeah, and it helps because when it helps when I from what I've seen giving back to the kids and being in these spaces. OK, but if you don't want to play basketball no more, OK, what else you going to do? Mm-hmm. Or if you don't want to do this, what else you going to do? Because just like it's important to have well-rounded people in these positions of leadership now, because these kids, they gravitate to people that they want to be like mm-hmm. people that they can see themselves um, walking in their shoes later, people that they look like, people that they resonate with. And you being so young and so close to their age, it also helps, too. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like my story and just my journey in sports, like playing and navigating through it um, to get to the point that I am today. Uh, it really makes me more relatable. You know, th- you have so many coaches out there um, who maybe didn't play or maybe didn't play college or, you know, just didn't have like these different experiences at different places. So it's hard to relate to them. Um, and so I think that like for me, uh, it was tough at first. Like, you know, you're so young, like you feel like, uh, do they respect me? Yeah. Do they look at me as one of them? Um, but as time has gone on, like, you know, I think my experiences have just helped me be more relatable to like give them actual tangible things to think about, 
um, to want to do or to want to be like. Um, and I know for me, uh, I had people like that in my life that I could look up to and, uh, you know, maybe they're not just my coach. Maybe it's someone that's like younger age that I feel like I can connect with. Uh, I think that's my sole purpose, like just to be able to give them an outlet and, you know, not feel like, uh, they only have to be this certain way yeah. or like do this certain thing. Um, I also think like being the assistant coach role, like you're kind of like, that's what you're expected to be. Um, I think it's hard for like head coaches because once you step over that, you know, or you move over that one seat, um, like it's hard for the kids to come to you yeah. and like, they don't look at you as like a voice of reason or someone that they can trust you to because they're it's like a job for them. So they want to be like perfect so that they can play and everything. Um, but yeah, I feel like all my experiences, uh, it helps me just be relatable to them um, and to have them know like, yeah, I've went through this before too. Uh, you know, I transferred too. I went, I have not worked at the same place for two years in a row since I, got in sports yeah, that's um, the norm too yeah so <laughs> that's a very unpopular i mean it is what it is working in sports that you have to be open yeah to movement i have not worked in the same place for two years and so that helped me though it helped grow me as a person to learn how to deal with different people um you know different areas like just made me a more well-rounded person um and so i think that that helps me be a coach and you know give back to my players in a way that you know maybe some older person or uh someone who hasn't gone through certain things can like give to them right so. and i also feel like that helps your girls in staying things outside of the ball like understand that this is what we're doing for four years but this ball can take you in look at all these other rooms like you and I have both been able to be in off the strength of the ball. Yeah. I haven't touched the ball in forever. Right. But I'm still, because it's a way to still be connected to it, mm -hmm. but use it. Yeah. Like, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm still using basketball. And you never will stop. Right. Um, And I think like people just think of basketball or sports in general in the terms of like, okay, if you don't go pro, like then... The, your career or what you you know learned or wh whatever you did before it doesn't matter um and especially for like women like coaching a women's team like most of our women don't play professional and so me as a coach i want to be realistic with you that it's a very small chance that you will go on to the next level to play professionally in the WNBA. Now, a lot of people go overseas, so I'm not taking that away. But like the WNBA, like it's not very many people that are going, you know, some of the best. So Adrian Molly to not be in the WNBA to me, like they're going crazy. to get drafted and getting cut. Yeah, it's, it's very cutthroat. It's very tough. And so. Um, you know, having that realization and that honest conversation, like, hey, you need to be prepared for a life after, you know, it, yeah, the, the ball will stop bouncing, you know, use it to your advantage. So many, I feel like so many kids these days, they let their sport use them when it sounds bad, but you should be using your sport. You're going no, to school for free. That's what it's supposed to yeah, be. Yeah, <laughs> you, you should be doing the internships. You should be just putting your name out there because the ball will stop for you at some point. And there is such a small percentage of people who go on to continue to play. And so, uh, you know, just empowering my girls to know, like, it doesn't matter if you go play professional, but what do you do outside of like when you when it's done for you? What do you do with your life then? You know, that's the real win for me. You getting your degree and you being a good person in the society who, you know, I had an impact on you figuring out, you know, your next steps of life. And it's tough. Like I know for men, uh, it's very tough because everybody wants to go professional as a man, like football, think about, yeah. uh, you know, NBA. It, that's all they, that's what they work their whole life for. Um, and so I think like, having more realistic conversations with student athletes is like something that needs to be had. Like, you know, there needs to be, uh, and I feel like they do the NCAA and 
colleges themselves, they do a, a lot better job of like providing the resources um, per se. But like, you know, it needs to be said, like there is such a small percent. There's a small percentage of kids who went on to play college. So like it's even smaller to go play professionally. Right. And I think our duty as, you know, college coaches, college administrators is to prepare them for like, OK, what if you don't do this anymore? You know, so. That's kind of mine. It's important to have a coach in that space to, to say that too. Mm -hmm. Because looking back, I, mm, I don't think my coach has ever asked about anything outside of basketball throughout my four years. Everybody's experience is different, but now this society's new generation, we're thinking more so outside the box. Yeah. Okay, I have you for four years, but how else can I help you outside of these four years? Mm -hmm. Because it's so important because kids get connected to those four years. They're connected to this ball. And yep. If you don't prepare them for anything outside of that, you get to see it's sad. Mm -hmm. Like everybody doesn't have the strength mental, mentality that we had or they don't have the support. And thinking about a lot of kids don't come from much. Right. So yeah. I, I did what I was supposed to do. I got my college degree and God knows what. And that's another thing. Making sure that you major in something that's beneficial to you. Mm. Do not go to school <laughs> and get a degree in liberal arts gym like use it it's free yeah use it you're literally they're paying for four years and they they knock on sport management but if you, as long as you use it wisely you can literally do what you want with sport management but a lot of athletes do it i got pushed into it mm -hmm. i made the best out of it but there's so many different avenues that you can go oh, outside yeah. of the typical the african-american studies the sociology the anthropologies i'm not pulling no cars the sports management this is this is what is the norm in our in it's right. an athlete society mm -hmm. but it's important that you have a coach like okay listen you're here for four years but what else do you want to do mm -hmm. or what can i how can i help you in these four years prepare you for something afterwards and i applaud you for the space that you're in because baby i don't have that i don't have the patience to do that. <laughs> i love the kids i love the girls but that is working in college athletics burnt me out in a year and a half and i quit it's, it's not for everybody it's not it's a very tough demanding um, I don't know. I could probably use so many other words. Um, industry. I think that you you one hundred percent have to love what you're doing. Um, have you're, to. you're not gonna get paid a lot of money. Uh, you know, it takes time. Just like I feel any job, but you know, maybe if you're working in something that's pretty frugal, like you can get out and and get out of college and have a good job. But um, you know, I'm still climbing the ladder. Yeah. You know, st even with that assistant coach title, I'm still having to learn and you know meet the right people, make the right connections because. I'm not always going to be in this one place that I'm at. Um, and I have a realization of that. But I mean, it goes back to saying I have not been at the same place for two years. I was a GA. I, well, I worked at the MEAC one year. I was at Maryland one year. Um, I was a GA for one year. I didn't even finish and get my degree because I got a job as a director of basketball ops. And I mean, any you, you would know this, but when you get a job opportunity, you take it right. um and so that was a no-brainer for me uh then i was i got my first assistant coaching job at coppin state um shout out to coach woods i love him uh and then back here at uncw so i've been six different places i've had to pack up and move my life six different places six. In four, was that four years yeah we're 28 yeah uh, about yeah four years um and it's been worth it though um i think that you start to see as, as you continue to climb the ladder and continue to do things, you start to see the fruits of your labor um, and, you know, just get more confident in what you're doing and who you are as a, a person, as a coach, as a professional. As a yeah. professional. Um, and yeah, it's it's not easy. It, I we we do a <laughs> lot. I spend a lot of time, you know, we're in season right now, um, you know, playing games, going recruiting, doing scouts practicing Listen, uh, working out. <laughs> yeah i'm working now i'm about to go to a tournament as we speak but uh yeah it's it's all worth it if that's what you want to do and you know like I, I set my sights on it like okay you know i've been working in this for a while this is what i want to do um and so you know you pick up and learn along the way but i just want to like you said i want to somebody to look at me i want my nieces and my nephews to look at me and be like oh you know look what my aunt did you know i can still achieve 
things no matter what space I'm in. Um, and yeah, I'm just I, that's like the biggest thing for me is just being able to, you know, I'm talking about my nieces and nephews, but like even my younger brother, you yeah. know, I want him to be able to look at my situation and go. Yeah. If he wants to coach after college, if he wants to play or whatever he, he wants do to do. He yeah, he can do it. And so I think that that was one of my sole purposes is just also to show people like you can do whatever you put your mind to. And it's so early in the game for you. You're only 28. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what's what's your ultimate career goal? What's your ultimate end goal for Kiana? You know. This, that's what I'm saying. It's only been four years and you did all this. I'm trying to. I can to, only imagine where we're going to be at 38. I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, you and know, there's, okay. yeah. there's so many avenues that you can take in this uh, this business. Um, you know, obviously, I want to be a head coach one day. Um, I think I'm I'm learning uh, just or in such a short time, I've learned I'm learning how the business works uh, that, you know, everybody says they want to be a head coach and, you know, whatever. But I have actually gotten the behind the scenes of what it's like to be a head coach. And so I think that that's something that I really needed to see to, you know, be able to assess whether I was going to do it. Um, and so, yeah, I want to be a head coach one day. Not really sure what level, but um, I'm still trying to, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that piece out. Uh, I think eventually I'll maybe get into admin, uh, you know, SWA or assistant AD, AD, but I don't know. That's the beauty <laughs> of it. And that's the one thing that I admire about your process. Cause you have to learn to enjoy the process and mm -hmm. enjoy the journey. Cause when you're doing something that you love naturally, it's not going to all be what we expect it to be. Right? right. And, but when you love it though, it makes it that much easier to keep going. Mm -hmm. And you see your purpose. You see the fruits of your labor. You see why you went through what you had to go through in college to get to where you are. You see why everything plays comes together full circle. And it takes a very special mind to see that in the midst of it. Yeah. And that's, I think that's been the beauty of my journey as well. Because just like, I've been exposed to so much and we're only 28. <laughs> I've been so many places in this industry mm -hmm. already. And I have a whole lifetime to go. Right. And it's cool because you see people our age and girls that we're, that are, that we're leading, they look up to us just because of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm still figuring, I tell kids all the time, like, I'm still figuring out just like you. Yeah. And I think that was the beauty of me being at Georgia Southern because even like putting on financial literacy classes and stuff like, yo, I'm learning this shit just with y'all too. Because nobody yeah. ever taught it to me. Yeah. <laughs> like I know I, I'm supposed to be an administrator, but I'm three years out from this. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. And I want to applaud you. I'm proud of you. Oh, thank you. I love to watch your journey, your thank growth. You. And finally, um, sport exposure question. Okay. What do you want to expose? Sport exposure is all about exposing journeys, um, stories, or really anything that nobody told us that you need to tell these this next generation of student athletes to hopefully stop them from going around. Maybe we didn't, we shouldn't have had to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, I feel like it's so much. <laughs> it is. Um, but I feel like one of the main things that I want to leave with student athletes is uh, to to not compare themselves or their journey with like their friends or other people that they're seeing on social media or whatever um, to just take advantage of, you know, their situation and make their journey their own. Um, I feel like they are doing that these days, but um, I feel just the social media presence has really changed a lot of the aspect of life. And, um, you know, we spend so much time like scrolling and comparing ourselves to one another and it really impacts the mental. Um, and so I, I really challenge, you know, these student athletes, you know, look in the mirror and, and find yourself um, and take your own journey and make it your own, no matter what it is. Um, and, and take advantage of just like being around sports still because it does end um, and, and make it work for you. Don't, don't let it work you, you work it. So. Love that. That was perfect. <laughs> Well, thank you again oh, thank for stopping you. by on your work trip. I know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Going to look at some hoops later. So <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank and you. I'm excited to see where you go next. I am. <laughs> well, that'll be. Stay tuned for yes, that one. Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll catch you guys next time. Yes.